Yes, Lord, we thank you for how great you are. Thank you for your power and your might and that you, you are a part of each, each little piece of our lives, Lord. Yeah, thank you for your goodness to us, that you speak to us, that you're so trustworthy, Father. I thank you for your care. Yeah, your care and your kindness to us, Lord. I pray these things in your name, amen. You can have a seat. Welcome here. Oh, there we go. <laughs> awesome. Good morning and welcome here to Ebenezer. Uh, to those of you who are with us in person and to those of us who are joining us online, we want to welcome you here and uh, we're so grateful for you to be with us. We just have a few announcements that we want to draw to your attention and then I'm going to uh, pray over our morning here. Um, just a couple of things. This upcoming week, we are going to be hosting, again, the Global Leadership Summit. That's going to be happening this Thursday and Friday. So for those of you who are registered, um, in the past, there had been a lunch provided um, in previous years. That isn't going to be the case this year, so we just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Um, a couple other things. Because it is the long weekend, we don't have Rush or Kid Zone available for our service this morning. However, if your children are looking to kind of burn off a little bit of steam, we, we have the Kid Zone room available as well as the hospitality center directly across from us. Uh, but those spaces just need to be um, parent supervised. So if your children are comfortable being in the service, they're more than welcome here. Or if they're looking to kind of expend a little bit of energy, uh, they'll just need to be parent supervised in those spaces. Uh, and then lastly, <clears throat> If you are interested in being baptized, we are going to be having a baptism on August 14th. And if there's something that you are considering, um, something that you would like to learn more information about, please get in touch with Pastor Chet. But um, there's a little bit of a deadline on this. We need, if this is something that you're interested and would like to be baptized on the August the 14th, you'll need to be in touch with Pastor Chet by August the 5th. So that's going to be later this upcoming week. So if that's something you'd like to consider, make sure to get in in touch with him by the fifth. And I have the privilege of praying, with us, praying for us this morning, so if you would just join with me in prayer. God, we thank you so much that you incline your ear towards us. We thank you, Lord, that you are not a distant deity. You're not some God who we have to coerce or manipulate or sacrifice to just so that to get your attention. You are a God who draws near. You have our attention, Lord, and we are so, so grateful for that. Thank you that there is not a detail in our lives that you are unaware of. We thank you that nothing is out of sight from you, and we can take great comfort and peace knowing that you care about every detail of our existence, God. We give you praise and thank you for that. And God, we just want to lift up to you a few things. Uh, in particular, God, we want to lift up the Global Leadership Summit that's going to be happening this weekend. God, we thank you for all the work and all the volunteers who are, are loaning their time to serve and to give in this way. And we pray for everyone who would come. That, Lord, uh, as they grow, we pray that this would be a really enriching time for them to grow as leaders. Whatever sphere of influence they may be in, whether it be in the church or in business or education, whatever, whatever that their sphere of influence might look like, God, we pray that they would learn skills and have a renewed mindset in how they can lead more effectively. But I also pray, Lord, for those who would be coming and attending this who maybe don't know you yet. And I pray for the speakers who will be a part of this summit, who know you and follow you. I pray that your blessing and anointing would be upon them as they share. And as they share scriptural truths, would you use that to bring them into a deeper contemplation and a deeper understanding of your son, Jesus. And Lord, we also want to pray um, as it's summer and it's wedding season. We know that there are lots of people who are getting married or will be getting married soon. 
With that in mind, we even just think about Pastor Will and Emma as they'll be getting married later on this week. We pray for them, Lord. We pray your blessing over their marriage, over their commitment together. We ask that your hand of protection would be upon their covenant and that you would strengthen and prepare them for their marriage together, God. But I also pray for those, Lord, just... um, you know, in the context of, of so many people, it, it, that being the wedding season, Lord, I pray that you will strengthen marriages. I pray that you will protect marriages from disunity and disconnection. We know the enemy loves to destroy marriages, and so we pray your hand of protection and your hand of grace to be upon marriage commitments because we know that they help build a healthy society. But I also pray for those who are single, maybe by choice or by circumstance. But regardless, as the church, Father, I pray that we would be a true spiritual family, welcoming and making space for everyone, regardless of the season of life that they find themselves in. Your word tells us, God, that you, um, you set the lonely in families. And I pray that as the church, we would be a true spiritual family, welcoming and making space for everyone, no matter where they are at, God. And lastly, Lord, we pray for Spencer as he comes to share with us this morning. We thank you for his heart and for who he is. God, we ask for your anointing to be upon him as he opens up the scriptures for us this morning. May our mind be open to what you would want to say and our hearts to receive more of who you are into our lives. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's a real pleasure to introduce Spencer. For those of you who do not know Spencer, he leads our one of our church partner congregations in the Meadow Green community, and he just has an amazing heart for God and for people. And I know you're going to be blessed this morning by what he has to share. So thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming. It's always an honor and a privilege for me to be able to share in this church. I, I am blessed. Thank you so much. Just to tell you that um, as long, uh, along with me being uh, a pastor at the House for All Nations, I also am a chaplain at the jail. And on Thursday, uh, we, were, we baptized three young men in the jail. And uh, because we are Baptists, right, we want to dunk them down there deep and get them up again, but the jail didn't allow that to happen. So. The pastor that was with me had these huge jugs that he went to fill up with water and he was getting the temperature right, getting it all sorted and we put blankets around so that it would catch the water and then in the process of of the baptism, uh, he would ask everyone who was being baptized, why do they want to be baptized? And one of the young men, he said, because he knows God has forgiven him for the life that he has taken. And I realized, you know, we we minister to all those young men there, but we never really know why they're there unless they tell us. And I realized that this young man was there because he took someone else's life. And as he confessed um, his love for Jesus and the reason why he wants to be baptized, he said, for the first time, He knows that he is truly forgiven and that he has a hope and that he has a future in Jesus. And that's why he wants to be baptized. And it's an incredible privilege to be able to minister in jail. Uh, I, I can just share with you so many amazing stories of young men coming to Jesus because they're at the end and there's no other place they can be Uh, at least very few lower places they can go. And they cry out to Jesus in jail, and he answers their prayers. And a a wonderful privilege to be there as well. So I'm going to be continuing our message on the Ten Commandments. And the commandment that I'm sharing today is, Thou shalt not steal. And I have a reasonably long introduction before I get to the commandment. But I hope you'll see my reasoning because um, one of the chaplains actually was sharing in this past few weeks, uh, Alan Stovall, who's, who also comes to our church, and um, he, he actually told me he got to the Eighth Commandment and he looked up a lot of commentaries and a lot of things that he looked and he says, there's nothing really else to add 
to this command, you know? So it says what it says. But so I'm going to just try and give a little bit of a background to what it means to not steal and not just taking things from someone that you shouldn't take, right? So a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Leighton laid down a wonderful, wonderful foundation to the reasoning why the Ten Commandments came into being. In other words, he gave a background why we find it in the Bible. Why is it there? And what is the reasoning God had in mind to put it there? And how it would be relevant in our lives today? Something that was given a few thousand years ago, how it can actually still lead and guide our lives today. Because it is eternal truth. It never changes. And without those Ten Commandments, I think this world will be in a very chaotic place. So, many countries through the ages in the world have used these laws as the basis to their law structure or as a basis for their ethics. Even countries that did not believe the Bible to be the Word of God have benefited from this eternal truth. I met a man in India many years ago called Vishal Mangalwadi, and um, he is a social reformer, a political columnist, an Indian Christian philosopher, and a lecturer who is well known all over India as a Christian apologist, apologistist. Sorry for that. And um, he argues that the Bible, its ethics, and its laws are what transformed India and brought her into the modern world as the Bible, he used the Bible as the backbone and um, the reasoning for his argument and his thesis. And I've uh, seen some, some, some meetings on, on YouTube and places that have recordings where he would speak to very, very intellectual uh, believers of other religions and he, was, uh, he had a real amazing insight into the Word of God. It's amazing when you see such very, very clever people um, being anointed by the Holy Spirit, loving Jesus with everything that is in them, and then giving them this genius that goes along with it. And then they speak to people that are very smart, and they can truly show the, the wisdom and the intelligence that the Word of God has. And so he's one of those people. And he has an amazing story how he shows that the ethics and even the Ten Commandments in the Bible has taken India to a nev another level in regard human rights, in regard to um, uh, just having laws that are ethically correct in that way. So... To get back to the, the message in a way, there is an eternity about these commands that go way beyond even the time period that it was, what was revealed to the Jewish nation as it was being formed. And we will see that there is an eternity about these commands, that even though it was given to the Jewish nation on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus and also Deuteronomy, there was a plan that God set in place long before the earth was formed regarding the ethics and the laws that he wants us to move in as a society. As a matter of fact, if you think about it, if we would take the Ten Commandments and what it teaches away out of our ethics, if you would take it away out of the system how we see what is right and what is wrong, I don't think we will be living in a world that has got the social structure and order that it has today. We will be surrounded by chaos. It will be dog eat dog. The fittest and the strongest survive. It is only because God has placed these eternal truths for us to follow, even in a society that does not believe the word of God as being something that they would like to have as a law in their lives. These laws make sense because without them, we will be like animals. And it is because God has given us an eternity in our hearts regarding 
our image in who we are created that these laws can function and work in our society. We have such a limited perception of eternity at play regarding God's salvation of mankind. God had plans long before the world even came into being. Even before the first spark of existence came into being, God planned the knowing of himself to the, to the heart of culture, to the heart of many nations. No matter how far or how wide they were dispersed over all the earth. In so doing, God has been at work since the beginning of time in all cultures, in all people groups, revealing himself in unique ways and preparing an introduction of who he is in the same context that he revealed himself to the Jewish nation long before any Christian missionary ever showed up. When I was a student of missiology, our professor brought me into contact with an amazing author by the name of Don Richardson. And he's written quite a few books, but the book that really moved me and to seeing amazing truths that God revealed to him, the book's name is Eternity in Their Hearts. And it's a play on the text found in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to the end. We have very limited vision. God has planned things long before Adam and Eve even were born or created on earth. Long before even this world came to existence, God had in mind to reveal himself to the peoples who were to come. Even cultures at the ends of the earth that did not have a physical Bible or scripture in their hands. God loves the world and he will not leave any culture or any nation without having some form of revelation of who he is so that they can come to a true understanding of who their creator is. In his book, Don Richardson tells stories of many groups and cultures from around the world, examining their religious practices and beliefs, trying to find some common thread with Christianity. And this is where I learned of the term a redemptive analogy, a key that God has placed eternally before even culture started in the hearts of people so that when the gospel would be brought to them, when they would find out who Jesus is, they would know that there was something about this in their culture that, that resonates with this, that quickens their hearts, that makes them interested knowing that we are dealing here now with something that's not just a story, not just a myth or a legend, but it is the key to connecting with the Creator. Don Richardson talks of Epimenides, an ancient prophet from Crete who built an altar in Athens to an unknown God. Many years later, the apostle Paul uses this as a jumping off point to explain the message of Jesus. There was an altar to an unknown God amongst all those gods. And God had it in mind that that altar or that little idol or altar, whatever it is, was there so that when, when Paul came, he could use that as a key to introduce the Greek people to their creator. In the 1800s, various groups of Asia believe in one God who created everything. This is research that Don Richardson did regarding many cultures as he went across the world, uh, finding out what these keys were in different cultures. And he saw how God already prepared cultures ahead of time, people groups, so that when Jesus would come 
And when he would be revealed, their hearts would immediately cry out that this is the God they've been wanting to hear from all their lives, their creator. And so he shares of groups in Asia who believe in one God who created everything, and they wait for a messenger to bring them the holy book they have lost so they can be reconciled to God. These people are overjoyed to receive the message of Christianity, although it is quite foreign to their cultures. I also read a book by Richard Twiss, a very interesting author, uh, a First Nation man that uh, writ, wrote a few books. Uh, the book that I read, uh, which was so interesting, is called Taking the Gospel Back from the Cowboys. And, uh, and in it, he, he speaks of North American tribes that had shaman, that had visions, that people would be coming to talk to them and they would be dressed in, in black clothes like the, the first pilgrims who came, and they would have leaves with them, and on these leaves would be written the eternal truth of who God is and that he would introduce them uh, to this God. Uh, two or three uh, examples of Amer North American native cultures that have, were prepared for when missionaries came to speak to them about, uh, about who Jesus is. There was a young lady who, who started off in the Bible school where we, where we were trained as missionaries. And she eventually went to, to China. And uh, she worked in Lhasa. She started a tracking company. And uh, she was called to a, a, a nomadic group of people in the Himalayas. And Angie met a lady there that was a missionary long before she got there. And an interesting story that Angie shared about this lady that was, she was a missionary in Israel for many years. And uh, she learned the language, she learned the Hebrew, she learned the culture, she learned so all the things that she needed to be a good missionary to the Jewish people. And then after about 15 or 20 years, after she felt she's now settled, she's got the language, she's understanding, she's got a group of people she feels comfortable with, God says she needs to go to China. And so she had a long struggle with the Lord to try and understand why he would bring her to Israel, allow her to go through all the things she did just to call her to China. And eventually, as I think most of you who have had uh, an encounter with God, and God asks you to do something, uh, God wins in the end. And so God, uh, she was obedient, and she went to China. And as she got there, God laid on her heart, on her heart, a group of people who were in the Himalayas, way, uh, you couldn't get there by road, you had to track for many, many days, you had to have yaks, that they carried all their belongings, a long, long track to get into the Himalayan mountains. Eventually she got to the village that she believed the Lord laid on her heart to go and minister to. But there was a problem. They didn't want to allow her to come in. So she decided to put up a tent a few kilometers just outside the village on the road that goes into the village and she camped out in this tent for a very long time. And as she stayed there, the people in the village would come in and go out. They would start to speak to her, and they would start to get to know her. And then eventually she won their, their hearts to such a point, and they trust that they asked her to come into the village. So she went into the village, and she stayed in the village with these people. And as they realized and saw her heart, her love for them that Jesus put there, they started to trust her even more. And one day the chief of this village told her about a box, a wooden box that has been in their village as long as they can remember. For centuries and centuries, they can remember that their ancestors have this box. They don't know what it is, but they know it's holy and they know it's an auspicious object. And they brought this box out to this lady. And as they opened this box, she saw scrolls in the box. 
And as she opened the scrolls, she saw readings of Isaiah in Hebrew. And she could open up the scrolls and read to them the word of God that was brought to their village literally centuries and centuries ago. And she could share with them about this God who prepared them that they would hear the message of a creator who loved them, a creator who wanted to reveal himself to them and who showed them the way in Jesus Christ. And so this is just one of us many stories that, that, that I've read and now personally heard from Angie of how God prepares cultures to know him and when he reveals himself to them that their hearts are already receptive and open for that word. Other ethnic groups that Don Richardson have, had investigated and studied over the world have a variety of religious practices which a missionary can use to preach the gospel. These keys, these redemptive analogies, if only they are willing to study the culture enough to, and to find these keys. Some groups have play, a, a place of refuge where violence is absolutely forbidden, reflecting the cities of refuge that we hear of in the Bible. Some groups cast their sins onto an animal or object, calling to mind the ceremonial scapegoat used by the Israelites to take away many sins. I remember of a book that I, I read by Francine Rivers and then saw the movie called The Last Sin Eater about a group of pilgrims who here in North America came across, this is based on true, true events, um, even though it's a, it's a novel, and the, the story goes about a group of pilgrims that came into a valley, a beautiful valley, a valley that they thought this is where they want to settle, where they want to start a new life. But there was only one problem. They saw the teepees in the distance and the, and the smoke from the campfires, and they knew that this was a, a land that belonged to another group of people. So what they did was they rounded up those people and with their horses and with their guns, they forced them over the, an edge of a cliff. And they totally annihilated this whole village and they took the land for themselves. And in the process, their consciences could not get over this terrible thing that they did. And as this village grew and as it could not deal with this terrible guilt in their hearts. They devised a plan. They chose someone in, the, in this little town to be a sin eater. And they would place their guilt and their sins on this man or a lady. I'm not sure um, if there could have been a lady, but this was the story. It happened to be a man. And then this man would take the sin of this whole village upon himself and then have to go live in the mountains and eventually die. And then the story goes in, in this book about a past a missionary that came to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to these people and revealing to them that there is a last sin eater that took all their sins upon himself on a cross and bought for them their pardon through repentance and through calling out on the name of Jesus. There are keys in cultures or people groups that point to the eternity of the Creator in their hearts. Because of these ancient truths have been placed into the hearts of every single person, even after the fall, uh, exactly, actually, after the fall, when sin entered the world, parts of, if not all, of the Ten Commandments run through the history of these ancient cultures. And things like punishment for stealing or having an adulterous affair with another man's wife form part of their ethical structures so that they know what is right from wrong. 
they know what is good and they know what is evil. These are truths that God has placed in every culture since the fall. Even though they might have been dispersed to places and centuries and centuries later might be worshipping everything except the true living God. There is an eternity there that comes from the Creator Himself. So today we are reading and continuing the Ten Commandments. And this is my little introduction. Quite a long introduction, right? But it's important for us to understand that these Ten Commandments actually form part of the history and culture of mankind even long before it was given on Mount Sinai to the Jewish people. So we have the ten which go like this. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. That's the 10th commandment. And today we're looking at, you shall not steal. Four words, concise, short, and to the point. There's no hermeneutical or, exeg or exegetical gymnastics that we can do to try and explain these words. You can't try and analyze the original language or try and see the context or try and draw other inf uh, inferences to try and see if there's some other way that we can try and interpret this or try and put it into the context of our culture and how we can see it. It says it what it is. You can't change this. You will and you shall not steal. This is God's command. There's a history to this sin, to this commandment that tells us about this sin. And it started even before this world was created. When Satan decided in his heart to rebel against the Creator, one of the root causes of this rebellion was the desire to steal from God what only belonged to him. In a coup attempt, he tried to take God's kingdom, God's power, and God's glory away from him. We see this mentioned in the book of Isaiah, 14 verse 12 to 17. I'm reading from the modern English version. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the, na the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also on the mount of the congregation in the recesses of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will make the Most High, I will be like the Most High. And as I, I read this, I just realized how many I am's are here that he decided he will, he said, I will, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne. I will sit in the congregation in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights. I will be like the Most High. And then God speaks to this. He says, you shall be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Those who see you shall stare at you and ponder over you. Is this the man who made the earth to tremble and shook the kingdoms, who made the world as wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? Once Satan and a third of heaven's hosts the angels who are today manifest as demons. And as I, I said in the, in the morning message, as I preached earlier, uh, if you don't believe there are demons, you, sh you should come and join me even in the ministry that we are doing amongst First Nation people. Uh, a little while ago, we had a demon speak to us in clear language, saying to me, who are you? 
I have been here for thousands of years. Demons are real. When we were in India, we saw incredible scenes of people completely possessed by demonic forces and powers. And yet, as we mention the name of Jesus, as we talk to them, and as we cast them out in the name of Jesus, they obey because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. I've seen how someone with epileptic fits because of a demonic entity, as we drive that demon out in the name of Jesus being completely healed, all epilepsy left. And that is the most amazing truth when one goes into cultures where darkness and evil and fear reigns and rules and you bring the peaceful, joyful, most powerful name of Jesus. It changes hearts. It sets people free. The Bible goes on to speak about what happened when this first rebellion, when the stealing started in heaven. It says, there was a, in Revelation 7 verse 9, there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, and the dragon lost the battle, and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the world, and he's deceiving our world even today. And he was thrown down to earth with all his angels. He's here. He has deceived and he is still deceiving. But Satan did not stop once he left heaven. As I mentioned, today and even to Adam and Eve, he started that same lie, that same stealing of the truth. Genesis 3 verse 1 says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the God, Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you may not eat from the, from the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? And just there, that lie, that deception was given in a way that they pondered on this and they thought about it. And as that little lie was given a foothold, it grew to a point that they started to believe it. And they trusted in what they heard from Satan. And they, in essence, gave away the inheritance that God had for them. This lie is still told to us today. Is Jesus real? Does God love me? Is there a God? Do I need to change my life? Why all those little lies that, have, that are trying to come to rationalize to us? And when we allow those little lies to take a foothold, it is very easy to go on a tangent. And when you end up in, the, in, in parts of your lives, God does not play any role anymore in anything you do, in anything that you think or say. When Adam and Eve decided to believe this lie, when this was formed in the heart of our ancestors, it led to Satan stealing from us our relationship with our Creator. And he literally stole our lives away from us. In the same way, this command that says, Thou shalt not steal, the same truth of what it says can be found in every other of the, of the nine other commandments that we see. The first command reads, You shall have no other gods before me. If we have any other god, whatever, whoever it may be, in essence, by putting them in front or before God in our lives, we are stealing from Him by taking what should solely be devoted to Him and giving it to something or someone else. 
I believe in part why this God, why this makes God angry, why he says he's jealous towards that, is not because he has an ego problem, not because he wants only to be worshipped, but there is a deeper eternal truth about why God says we should only worship him and have no other God before us. It is because God knows that when we give ourselves to anyone or anything else beside himself, we cannot be saved. If we, if we give our lives to anyone else except God, when we try to find life and meaning in anything other than who he is, we find ourselves in a stolen condition and this condition leads to death. It leads to separation. But God made a plan in Genesis 3 verse 16 already that he made a plan to buy us back legally through the cross of Jesus Christ. The second command reads, you shall not make idols. Any idol is a physical image, or whether it is a physical image like the golden calf that uh, the Jewish nation made just after um, Moses went up onto the mountain. Anything whatsoever that takes away from our soul devotion to Jesus is stealing from him. It's stealing from what belongs to him alone. The third command reads, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. This is a very interesting command that has been quite rested on our hearts, my family, my wife and I, for quite some time regarding this, the dishonoring of the name of our everlasting creator. God has something interesting to say about this in Malachi 3 verse 16. It's amazing how many of the scriptures are like John 3 verse 16, Malachi 3 verse 16. If you go and see Romans 3 verse 15 and 16, very big things it says. And then here in Malachi, uh, it says here, then those who feared the Lord spoke to with, to with each other and the Lord listened to what they said. In his presence, a scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about the honor of his name. They will be my people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will call again. Excuse me, let me read that again, verse 18. Then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who don't. So uh, uh, quite a while ago, uh, my wife and I, we, 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 we love to watch movies. We have Netflix and we have some other uh, channels like, like um, Amazon Prime and things like that. And we start, uh, we, something started, uh, one day we watched a movie. And in this movie, a very, I can't remember, but there was an exceptional blaspheming of the name of Jesus in this movie. And I realized it just, it just went straight against my spirit in my heart. I actually cringed inside when I heard how the name of Jesus was blasphemed in this movie. And then after that, every time we watched the movie, when they would, then they would mention the name of Jesus in such a disrespectful way, a dishonoring way, it just cringed inside me. And I said to Corin, I think God is talking to us about this. We, we better do something about this. So I said to her, let's make a, 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 an agreement. When, when we watch a movie and, uh, and they mention the name of Jesus in that blasphemous way, we'll stop the movie. And, uh, and then something happened. We started to watch very little movies because um, in about, let's say, 100 movies that we watched, I think, honestly, about three movies we could watch right through. 
Because all the other movies, you try and test this to see how many movies you can watch without the name of Jesus being blasphemed in that movie. I tell you, we tried it. We, we stopped. We couldn't go through a movie anymore. And you know how difficult it is when it is at that point where the whole movie gets to its crux and you want to watch it and you're so excited about what's going on and blankety blank, blank, blank. And you go, okay, so we need to turn this off now. And then there's this humongous desire in you to let's just watch another one minute or two minutes and then by the end you realize, no, this is not going to work and you turn the thing off. So we had a problem. And uh, we could ob obviously stop watching movies, but then by God's grace, we heard of an app called VidAngel. And VidAngel is an amazing little app that you can get on your computer or on your phone, and it relays all the movies, not every one, but most of the movies that you want to watch through these channels like, um, uh, like Netflix, or uh, Apple, Apple TV or whatever. And what it does is it takes away all the blaspheming. It takes away all the swearing. And there's about 50 different filters you can put in there, including taking away all nudity, including taking away all excessive violence. Uh, I once tried this. I said, let me try and put all these ticks in there. And so we watched the movie, and in the end, the movie was about 20 or 30 minutes shorter than what it was supposed to be. But what an amazing feeling that once it was done, you can say, oh, we actually finished the movie, and we actually honored the name of the Lord in all of this. Anyway, if you want to know more about it, you can Google it. It's called Vid Angel. And, um, and as I was saying this this morning, I just realized, you know what? If you want to watch movies and it doesn't bother you, that's fine. Please, I, I'm not judging anyone here. But I'm just sharing something that was really strong on my heart regarding my wife and, and, and how we live our lives before the Lord and to honor His name. So any time, which this, this actually, um, the fifth command, uh, uh, sorry, not the fifth command, I need to go to the notes just back here. Um, the third command that says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Anytime that happens, we are stealing from God's honor. And we bring him down to the level of his creation. And we lose the essence and the awesomeness of his holiness. Of the glory of who he is. Of the most amazing God who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we bring him down to our level. And it's in a way we form him into our image. And that is stealing from him. It's taking away from him. Yeah, that's, that's how that, that, that I really see the reality of how we steal in that way from God in this, in this command when it's transgressed. The fourth commandment reads, remember that the Sabbath, the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And this is also a very interesting command because how does this command have relevance in our lives today? And it is not in the same way that it did to the people of Israel so many years ago. But there is something about the rest that we can find in Christ. That when we find that rest, in him, he gives us what the world cannot give. So the Sabbath was a big deal in the day when Jesus was ministering here on earth. As a matter of fact, to prove to the Pharisees that Jesus was Lord over the Sabbath, he did seven of his miracles on this very special day, just to show them that he was Lord even over these commands. To rest is a sacred thing. This command, I believe, as much as it is a spiritual thing, also has extreme physical benefits to us. We all know if we don't rest, if we don't, if we work all, all those hours every day, if we, uh, we, we just continually do the things we're doing and we don't take a rest, 
it actually physically starts influencing us. We get high blood pressure. We get, um, uh, we can die of heart attacks. Our emotions, everything about us just goes out of sync if we don't rest. So there is an absolute benefit by us keeping this command, not in the form of a command of a rule and a law, but as finding freedom in Christ, finding him to be the one who is our rest. And as he becomes Lord, and as he becomes the essence of why we exist, we will make time to rest. We will make time to be found in his presence. And when we do that, things change. We see things differently. Our perspectives change. A lot of depression goes away. A lot of hopelessness goes away because we are in the right place before our Creator. By stealing our rest, we have made our busy activities the priority in our lives. And in so doing, we rob ourselves from rest and a time to regain our strength, to be truly connected to our family and have a position of peace, to enter into God's presence through prayer and worship. I've tried a few things um, regarding this. I have um, an app, I've got actually many Bible apps on my phone. But something about this phone that can be really distracting is so I know when I wake up I take my phone and I'm now going to have my quiet time so I open the phone up here it goes open and I open it and I and I uh, open and then all of us oh there's a Facebook message for me in the corner oh I've got a few emails that have come some of them are important and before I know it I've spent time answering these emails looking at the Facebook going through some nice little photos that somebody sent me, and my whole intention of wanting to spend time with God is just taken away. Even though there's this app on here, and then eventually I get to the app and I open it up, but then my mind is rushing and is so consumed by these little messages I had received beforehand that it takes me forever to get to the place of quiet, to get to the place of rest so that I can hear his voice, so that I can experience his presence and his peace in my life. If we allow things and stuff to take away from this rest, it just, it steals from us. It steals our intimacy. It steals and doesn't give back what only God can give. So this is a very important part of this command. Even if it's a command, even if it's a law, in inverted commas, and Jesus has set us free from the law, there is a benefit that we gain when we allow a rest to come upon us so that the busyness of this world doesn't take away from us. So let's, um, let me just see where I was. Um, sorry, I've got to just go back to the notes. The fifth commandment reads, honor your father and your mother. By not honoring our mother and father, we steal from them the preciousness of who they are and we steal our love and respect from them and in so doing, make their existence into a trivial thing. We cheapen the existence of who our parents are and how we should look up to them in the context that is mentioned in the Bible. So we steal from them the position our Creator has given them in our lives and we make I and me the center of the universe in our lives. I don't know if you've experienced, even in your own lives, maybe have said something and done something to your mom or your dad that really just demeans their, their importance in your life. Or have you been in a conversation where somebody comes here with friends and someone comes, one of the kids come, and in front of everybody they totally disrespect 
and they totally dishonor the name of their parents. And, and you just cringe inside. There's this bad taste that comes into your mouth. And you just see how this takes away from the honor that we need to give our parents. The sixth command reads, you shall not murder. This command nearly speaks for itself. To steal someone's life, to take away someone's father or mother or children, to take away the preciousness of someone's existence who is made in the image of God. I don't think we have to really think more about that because it is what it is. We should not take anybody's life. The seventh command reads, you shall not commit adultery. Stealing someone's wife. How outrageous can this be? Stealing someone's virginity that was supposed to be the ultimate precious gift between a husband and a wife. How many lies throughout the existence of humanity have been ruined by tra the transgression of this commandment? The eighth command reads the one we are dealing with now. Stealing. You shall not steal. There is something interesting that the Bible speaks also about this command in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 6 verse 30 to 31 says this. Excuses might be found for a thief who steals because he is starving. And something that happened a few weeks ago to me when I was visiting No Frills, as I was going in, the security was busy handcuffing a young First Nation girl who was caught shoplifting, I guess. And I saw the fear on her face. I saw the panic that she was going through. And as the security was trying to handcuff her hands behind her, she was saying to him, I'm so sorry. I'm very sorry. I won't do it again. I was just hungry. And it just ripped through me. I actually couldn't go on with my shopping. I tried to help, but by then the police came and they, they put her in the back of the car. But I was so ripped inside. I can still see her face in front of me and the panic that she was now going to jail. You know, this command um, is spoken of that God gives us a, 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 a place where restitution can be made. It says here, but if he is caught, this is what this proverb says, he must pay back seven times what he stole, even if he has to sell everything in his house. A precedent is set to make restitution here. It can be fixed, in other words, but the transgression does not go unpunished. The ninth command reads, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Stealing the truth, the root of deception. This was and still is the ultimate robbery that Satan had towards humanity. The tenth command reads, you shall not covet, stealing with your eyes, stealing with your heart, taking what does not belong to you with your emotions. The law plays a big part. As I am uh, here, I can ask that the, the, the worship team can come up so long. I'm, I'm busy ending here. Thank you. So the law plays a big part, an integral part in our lives. If we, if we see it from the perspective that is revealed to us in the Bible, it has to shape us. It has to form us. But this is a law, right? And all of us transgress sooner or later. And what do we do when that happens? James 2 verse 10 says, For the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of these laws. And this is why only through Jesus Christ can we be set free from this law. 
that leads to death and we can become obedient to the law of love, the law of forgiveness, the law of grace, the law of kindness, the law of hope, of joy that only can be found in Jesus Christ. As we, as this young man who took a life of somebody else and could not forgive himself and was considering taking his own life because he could not live with this guilt in him. But as he heard of the name of Jesus, as he heard that there is a God, a creator, that can set him free from this, as he committed his life to Jesus, this guilt was taken care of. It was put on the shoulders and on the body of Jesus as he hung on the cross. Our sins and our transgressions of every one of these laws and every one of the 630 other laws that the Pharisees had was put upon Jesus so that we can stand forgiven, that we can stand set free in the presence of our Creator. It is the law of love that sets us free. Thank you very much. invite you to stand with us as we um, close in worship.
So I'm going to close off with a benediction. And these words are just so powerful. And I pray that they will go with you as you go into this week. And as you take Jesus into your hearts, set free from the law. And yet knowing that love compels us to do the things that is said in the law, to do good, to love people, and to make Jesus known. So it says here, may the God of peace, who raised Christ from the dead, strengthen your inner being for every good work, the work that, that the love of Jesus compels us to do. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and dwell within you this day and forevermore. Amen. May you go in peace. Thank you.